Hello and welcome to my video on the evolutionary explanations of food preference. Um, this is applicable to the PSYA3 paper as well as the new specification and that's going to be on paper 3, the, the eating behaviours topic. Um, they're, they're covered by both papers. What I've got here, this is the PSYA3 spec um, and I'll update the video um, for the new specification when it's uh, appropriate. Um, we are down to the fourth bullet point here, evolutionary explanations of food preference, so let's dive straight in. Um, the idea here comes from something known as the environment of evolutionary adaption. Um, and so the, it's obviously an evolutionary perspective, and as most evolutionary perspectives, it says that we have the behaviours we have now um, because they would have allowed an adaptive advantage in some sort of situation. So we can apply that to food preference and say, well, why do we eat what we eat now? Why do we have certain preferences, likes to certain types of food, and maybe dislikes to others? And we can look at it from an evolutionary point of view and say, well, maybe the foods that we liked, they would have been the ones that have provided an evolutionary adaption. They would have allowed us to survive in the environment. And our dislikes, um, they're the foods that obviously won't have allowed us to survive or potentially could have been harmful to us in, in evolutionary times. So you need to know about this environment of evolutionary adaption. That's the environment that our ancestors would have, would have um, evolved in. It's pretty self-explanatory. So if we apply this to food then, um, what it says is that our early diets, in terms of early, what I mean here is early in, a, in human evolution, uh, early diets would have come mainly from animals, from meat uh, and plants, and that, that's where the whole hunter-gatherer thing comes from. Um, and actually, we would have, in evolutionary times, it would have been very good for us to eat highly fatty foods. That's because they provide lots of calories and would have allowed us to survive from one uh, hunt, one kill, uh, one gathering of food to the next and so we we would have had to have had this preference for for fatty foods highly calorific foods um, you wouldn't need as much of it to gather it if it's highly calorific um, and it would have allowed us to survive between gathering food that makes sense it's, it's got face validity there um, you know if you had food that was low in calories and it took a lot of energy to to collect it to gather it uh, and you didn't get a great deal from it well you wouldn't have wanted that so from an evolutionary point of view fat fatty foods are good and highly calorific foods are good as well there's also the idea from the evolutionary point of view that we have a preference for meat as humans again you can probably see that um, a, a subjective level in in our everyday environment lots of cultures eat meat um, and so that kind of makes sense again the reason for that from an evolutionary point of view would be because meat provides lots of nutrients lots of things that we need to develop and survive um, especially kind of organ meat is very good for that actually liver hate liver and bacon but evolutionary wise liver and bacon would have been really good um or liver especially would have been good because it's high in nutrients kidneys brains even of of animals would have been really good things to eat um what i've got there it says forest receding so um the theory is that as we were evolving um maybe we we gathered a bit more to begin with we were we were looking at foods and plants but actually as um, environments change and as the forests potentially receded we would have had to have relied more on meat uh, and that's where that comes from. Researcher Mitten kind of backs that up um, and says that actually to get to where we are now to be you know we're seen as quite intelligent animals compared to other species we're very active to get to that stage we would have had to have eaten meat um, and we couldn't have got to the developmental stage we are now um, just relying on kind of plants and um, vegetables and fruits and things like that so that's why it's saying that we needed these meats these meats had the the minerals we needed they had the uh, amino acids we needed in able to to, sorry, to enable us to develop evolutionary, uh, for, for, sorry, from an evolutionary perspective. Um, what that then meant is that we could consume poorer quality um, vegetables, low quality, low nutrient plants that have got high calories and that will sustain us um, to from one sense one sorry set of food to the next um we're, we're what you call omnivores so we eat lots of different things we've got we don't just stick to one um food source there's meat there there's plants uh, etc this also leads on to um 
our idea of taste. So actually, believe it or not, we have five main tastes and this can be tracked back to evolution as well. So our preferences, um, and you know, you'd see this in, in children, in babies, um, and across different cultures. And again, that adds support to it. We'll look at that when it comes to the evaluation. But most humans have a preference to sweet things. So actually things that are sweet, they are and tend to be foods which are rich in carbs and provide us with lots of energy. So sweet things are good from an evolutionary point of view because they, they are highly calorific. Salty things, again, we need the salt for the minerals, for the development. Uh, cells need salt, and so we have a preference to that. Um, you've probably heard of all these other preferences or tastes before, sweet, salty, um, sour, bitter. You've heard of all of those things. Unami is a different one. So unami is the is a taste, um, but it's, it was developed more recently or discovered more recently. So you may not have heard of that. But unami is another taste preference that we have. Um, and this is this would have allowed us or this does allow us to, to prefer meat uh, and have this meaty taste. And they, those would have all been good things. They would have been things that we wanted and, again, would have allowed survival. Looking at the other side, we have a, a bias towards not liking things that are sour and things that are bitter. And, again, from an evolutionary perspective, perspective, these would have been the things that maybe could have been harmful to us. So sour tastes may have been food that would have gone off and so we should avoid them. If you eat too much of that, you could have you could have died and not pass on your genes from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, bitter foods, again, potentially poisonous plants, they should have been avoided as well. So we don't like the bitter and sour uh, and we do like the sweet, salty unami. And that's, again, all kind of an evolutionary point of view. This is all kind of AO1 knowledge information. Big bite. What do you think? Pretty good? You gonna try some more? <laughs> oh! <laughs> you didn't like that? You want it? Oh, goodness, <laughs> Last bit then, kind of for uh, the A1 is the taste aversion. So this is going more in detail into the stuff that we kind of want to stay away from. Um, some research done here into animals, um, and they show show something called bait shyness. So if you give rats bait to try and obviously catch them or something and if you give that with poisoned food what you'll find is that they won't eat all if it's new food they won't eat it all um, they'll, they'll have a taste and so because if they ate it all it could give the it could make them ill enough to kill them and again maybe we had this in it from an evolutionary point of view humans may have had this if you eat a lot of poison stuff you're more likely to die so actually you just kind of taste it and so that bait they're shy to that bait, so bait shyness, they, they won't eat a lot of it. Uh, and so you rats would learn quickly to avoid things that made them ill. Again, we can apply that theory to humans uh, from an evolutionary point of view. A um, bit of research to back this up, Garcia et al, what they did here, they uh, gave rats um, sa saccharin, probably haven't pronounced that correctly, which is a sweetener, uh, but it was new to them. Uh, and what they did is when they gave it to them, they gave them a dose of radiation, which, which made them ill. And what they found was when the rats were then given the sweetener again, they were less likely to, to eat it. Uh, and so that shows this, this taste aversion. Again, it would have been an evolutionary advantage, adaption to have this taste aversion. Uh, and then the last kind of thing then, it's almost the opposite of this, but it, it helps prove it. It's the other side of things, things that make us feel better, um, we'll, we'll eat those more. So again, that was Garcia et al. Um, more research here, but what they found was that um, we have preferences to things that, that make us feel better. Again, it's got a lot of face validity, but it, it helps us understand why we eat kind of what we eat. Again, this was given to rats. Um, these rats had a thymine deficiency. Thymine is needed for energy. Um, and so what they did, they would inject the rats 
with thymine um, and give them a new taste that they haven't had before. And what they found was when the rat was nice and healthy, had still had lots of energy, they would still show a preference to that flavour that they had been um, given when they were given the thymine injection. So it shows that they have noticed that that, that food that they had been given had benefited them and so they then uh, had a preference for that food. So that's pretty much, I've gone through that fairly quickly, but that's in, in a nutshell and it, it, it should make a bit of sense. Um, so we then need to go on to evaluating. Okay, so looking at evaluation then, um, we will look at some supporting research for some of these evolutionary theories. First off, and I have already mentioned this, we look at ch kind of babies and children's taste preferences. The idea of looking at taste preferences with babies and children is that they will have had obviously less environmental uh, um, kind of inputs than older people and adults. And so the idea here is if babies and children are, are liking certain tastes, it suggests that this is more to do with what they're biologically programmed to do. And that's what you find. So Gibson and Wardle um, looked at four and five year olds and they gave them fruit and veg. They had lots of different choices all laid out on the table. The children were hungry uh, and they could choose whichever fruit and veg uh, different types uh, prepared in different ways and they could choose whatever they they wanted. What they found was that the children chose the higher calorie fruit and veg. Now obviously the children wouldn't consciously know that they, they're doing that, that they're purposely going for the, the high calorie food, but that's what they did. So they tended to go for bananas, they tended to go for potato products, uh, and they are high calorie uh, fruit and veg rather than other types of fruit and veg that may be down to their, the sweetness or how much protein they had in them or how, or even, this was important as well, even how familiar they were with them. So they could have been fruit maybe apples that they'd had more, but actually when they were then presented with the bananas and uh, the potatoes, they went for them over over fruit and veg that they were more familiar with. So this supports the evolutionary preference. This supports the idea that we go for high calorie food because that would have provided us with some sort of evolutionary advantage. The next thing, and again, I think I did mention this when talking about the AO1, is culture. And that also allows us a chance to look at, well, is the environment actually influencing our food preference or is it biology is it inbuilt is it evolution uh, and that's essentially what we're trying to do here we're trying to say well is it the evolution or or is it the environment if it was environment what you'd expect to find is massive massive cultural differences in eating behaviors and so looking at it um so abraham has found that actually all societies show a preference to uh, animal foods and fats. So that supports the idea that actually maybe it is biologically within humans um, and not as much determined by your culture or by your environment, etc. Um, and so that supports, Abraham supports the idea that, um, yeah, we're, we're, our food preference is dictated by our evolution. Um, and... As well as this, what you find is that these food preferences that we spoke about in different tastes, sweet and salty and fatty food, that's universal as well. You find that across all cultures. However, uh, and this, is, this will be a really interesting evaluative point if you can do kind of almost uh, a pro and then a con. However, you obviously do see cultural differences in food, don't you? Like different cultures, um, maybe more Asian cultures, you tend to find spicier food, things like that. So there are cultural differences in what different cultures eat um, and that can't be um, explained via the evolutionary approach. Um, and so what the idea is at the moment is, well, we've got these basic drives, these needs for uh, high fat, high calorie food, um, preference to saltiness, etc. However, what they call the fine tuning, the the actual preference to maybe what dish you would choose at a restaurant, that may be more environmentally determined. Um, and so that's that, and that makes a lot of sense. Finally then, um, in looking at the supporting research, there's animal studies. And now animal studies allow us to um, support the evolutionary approach, particularly looking at chimps here. So chimps, you know, we, we evolved from monkeys. Um, and so what you might suggest is that more well, maybe chimps are um, in an evolutionary state more similar to what we were in 
um, the environment of evolutionary adaption. So maybe they're going through the issues now that early humans used to go through. Uh, and so if you can look at their behaviour, we can then compare that to well, what human behaviour might be like. They face similar challenges now um, to what we, we did. Um, and what you find is that chimps will go for the fat of a kill first. And so this, again, it supports this theory that, that we have got food preferences that are dictated to us through our evolution, um, uh, particularly for, for fatty food here. That was Stanford. Um, and so that all supports the, the evolutionary approach. So it's the children's studies, culture uh, and animal. OK, some further evaluation then. Um, well, one thing, and this kind of, I guess, goes against the evolutionary theory of uh, food preference. Um, and I hope that this kind of occurred to you when I was talking about the, the AO1, the theory. Um, actually, our evolutionary past now may lead us to issues. Um, so at the moment, in, in the times we are now, food is very plentiful for most cultures. Um, and it has led to some issues. So we still then have this um, preference for high fat, high calorie food. We want that all the time because it's, it's inbuilt within us. It's biological. We've evolved to be that way. However, now we're in this environment where the food is plentiful, it could lead to issues. And uh, this would obviously then start explaining why there's increasing obesity uh, in more developed countries. You look at America, Britain, um, people are getting bigger because they're still striving for this food, um, but uh, it's readily available. And so they're consuming more and more and more, uh, and that's leading to, to issues. So I, I said it's a weakness. It, it doesn't go against the theory. In fact, it supports the theory, but it says that um, it's now harmful uh, and we suffer from what's known as genome lag. So that is when um, we haven't evolved to, to cope, you know, it's only been uh, really recently, within the last 50 years or so, I guess, that food has been completely plentiful for more people. And so we haven't caught up with that. Evolution takes hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years. And so we, we've got this preference uh, and it's causing us issues. So our genes, our evolution hasn't caught up with the, the environment that we're in yet. Um, and so that's a really good evaluative point to make as well. Another thing, and um, we, we mentioned taste aversion when we were talking about the AO1, so being um, put off certain foods would again have an evolutionary preference. It would be a good thing if, if we avoided foods that were harmful. Uh, so this has been tested, uh, Sand, uh, Sandal and Bresling. Um, they took 35 participants and they tested their bitter taste receptor genes. So there's a gene that um, receives bitterness um, and what they found was that those who had higher sensitivity in those um, bitter taste buds um, they rated vegetables with uh, glucoinsulates now glucoinsulates are, are toxic uh, but they are existent in some veg so they're absolutely fine in small quantities high quantities of them could be toxic and broccoli is one uh, vegetable that's got uh, glu uh, glucosinulates in um, and what they found was that these people who had the the bitter uh, taste receptor gene as more sensitive they rated the the broccoli as more bitter as potentially more harmful and again that would have been an evolutionary advantage those people that do have this um, high sensitivity they obviously would have avoided this food that has this toxin in um, and so again that supports the idea that evolution has a role to play it supports the idea of taste aversion um, and this can be seen in if you've ever seen the film Inside Out Disney Pixar absolutely awesome uh, in general but good for psychology as well lots of stuff in there to do with kind of memory um, and um, disgust uh, and disgust is a little character a little green character um, and she doesn't like broccoli uh, and that can it's a good visual representation of, of this theory really All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Think it's safe? What is it? Uh... Okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yeah! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I'm going to finish up by looking at some issue debates and approaches. And there are a few that are particularly applicable to the evolutionary uh, approach to eating. So first is obviously, this is quite straightforward, I th I'd like to hope as a, as a debate. It's the nature-nurture debate. And obviously the evolutionary approach comes um, definitely from the nature debate. It's saying that we, we have our eating behaviours because it, it's, it's part of our nature, it, it's within us. Um, you can then compare, as a debate, you compare that to environmentally determined factors um, that you, you, we, look, we looked at earlier in this topic, so uh, culture, social learning, parents. And so the, the debate would be, well, how much of our eating is to do with um, what's biologically determined, nature, and how much of our eating is to do with nurture, what we've learned from our environment. And there's, there's definitely going to be an interaction there. The second IDA point... Um, probably would be reductionism. Um, reductionism is obviously taking a, a very complex idea uh, and explaining it in two simpler terms. Um, and you, you could potentially apply that to this theory here. It's saying, well, we, look, we, we eat fatty foods, we eat um, calories and that's it. And actually we know there's a lot more to do with our eating preferences. Can be, there's a lot of individual differences in there. Culture has a role to play. Lots of other things. So you need to take other ac approaches into account when you're determining and when you're trying to say why someone eats a particular food or not. Um, so that's another point. And last but not least, um, it's the animal research. And again, I hope you kind of picked up on that when I was talking about that. So a few of the studies I spoke about when I was trying to say, yeah, this is how we eat. Well, that was done on rats, they were done on chimps. So can you actually take those findings and extrapolate them onto humans and say, well, this is how humans eat? Well, it's probably quite difficult because uh, obviously humans have very different eating behavior, or, um, the availability of food would be very different, the environment we get food would be very different from the, from the animals. So actually, is that possible to, to apply results from animal studies? Um, maybe not. Okay, and that is pretty much that. Um, so yeah, this was taken from the, the Cardwell and Flanagan book um, and some information from the resource website as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done already. Uh, and until next time, goodbye.